So the question is, what is your dream? What is it that you really want to do? What is it that you're really afraid of? That you're afraid of doing? You're afraid of failing at? Afraid of succeeding at? And and I think most people will have that answer like that. They they'll cover it over. They'll make excuses for it, but they'll know it right like that. And 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 I don't think you can get out of a, a, a negative flow unless you get into a positive. Welcome to the Super Human Life. I'm your host, Frank Rich, and this is the only podcast in the world dedicated to helping men break free from the shackles of addiction through the power of faith and fitness. It is our goal with every episode to help you take back control and rebuild your body, mind, and spirit. And we do so by bringing you real and raw conversations with people just like you, aiming to find their place in this world while dealing with the everyday struggles and battles that we all face. Now, it is my belief that we were all created for a specific purpose. And if we can harness that belief or faith, then take control of our mind and body or fitness, then we can ultimately create the life that we've always dreamed about, our own superhuman life. I want to let you know how grateful and blessed I am to have you here with me today. Let's get on to today's show. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another amazing episode of The Superhuman Life. As always, I am your host. Frank Rich, and guys, I gotta tell you how incredibly excited I am to share today's conversation with you. My guest is an absolute legend. He's a legend in the fiction writing space. He's a legend in the kind of entrepreneurship artist space. Many of you will be familiar uh, with some of his work. You entrepreneurs are gonna be very familiar with his work. And for those of you that may not be familiar with him, you are gonna know some of his work. But before I get into introing our guest, Let me just remind you guys how incredibly grateful I am to have you here with me. You know, we're coming up on almost two years with this podcast and what a journey it has been. You know, just last week I was interviewed on a good, very good friend of mine, um, actually somebody that helped me in the early stages of putting this together. And it was kind of a checkup on where we're at. And, And this show has just done tremendous things in my life and I hope it's doing incredible things in your life as well. But it's been an amazing journey. It's been an incredible last few months, our downloads, uh, have doubled since uh, since just November. Our, our monthly downloads have doubled. And I know it's because of the guests that we're bringing on, it's the conversations, it's the value that we're having, but mostly important, it's because of you. It's because of your support. It's because of you sharing this podcast with those in your life that you know can find value in it as well. So my only ask from you here today is obviously stick around for today's conversation. But if you're continuing to get value out of these shows and and, and if they're speaking into you, if they're helping you, transform your life, make massive improvements, step into the life that you were created to live. The only ask that I have is if you could leave us a five-star rating and written review, whether it's on Apple, whether it's on Google Play, Stitcher, Podbean, wherever you're listening to these shows, uh, please do help us by supporting the show with leaving that five-star rating and written review. That is what's going to tell the algorithm. That's what's what's going to tell these platforms that there's value in these conversations. It's going to help it put it in front of more people's ears and eyes. And for those of you that are on YouTube, Uh, subscribe to the channel so you're notified every Monday when the video drops. Um, And then if there's somebody in your life that can get value out of today's conversation or any of the conversations that we've had here in the last few months with our amazing guests, uh, please do us the favor of just sharing it with them. So with all that aside, guys, we love you. We appreciate your support. My guest today is Stephen Pressfield. Stephen is an American author of historic fiction, nonfiction, and screenplays. After attempting to, 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 to write for 27 years, uh, he finally landed his first published novel with The Legend of Bagger Vance. Guys, did you hear that? 27 years he stuck at this. And over those 27 years, he worked in 21 different jobs from marketing to copywriting to driving a cab to driving a truck across the country. We talk a little bit about that story and how he was able to stay persistent and stay disciplined in his pursuit. Uh, but where we spend a lot of time, it, it is, is on a book that he wrote back in 2002. And this is the one that I was speaking to you entrepreneurs out there, you creative people, and really anybody in your life. If you have a dream in your heart, if you have something that has been placed there and a goal, uh, that something that you want to share with the world, we all know what it feels like to battle with this, this internal dialogue, this doubt, this, 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 this resistance, for lack of a better word. And, and this is really what Stephen's work has been really focused on with, with the work that he's done in the nonfiction space. Obviously, he, he wrote The Legend of Bagger Vance, and he has just been one of the world's you know, greatest novelists of fiction books, really centered around war 
uh, in battles. But the, 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 the conversation today uh, lends more towards the nonfiction side. And, and we talk about this resistance with a capital R. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a concept we all are familiar with. And Stephen does an incredible job of, of really articulating it from a creative's perspective. And what's really uh, great to hear is, is somebody, you know, of, of his stature. So he battled, you know, for 27 years trying to get something published. And finally, he had that big success. And still to this day, he's, he's, he's battling with these, these thoughts, these doubts, this, this resistance with a capital R. So it was incredible to hear him share some of that. But we talk about that. You know, we talk about how can we work through this? How can we overcome this? The conversation, conversation then takes an incredible spin somewhere where I didn't think it was going to go. Uh, but we talk a little bit about addiction and how addiction is really its own unique form of resistance. And, and you guys know with the work that I do and, and the mission that I'm on, that's, that's just a part of the conversation. I got so fired up. So make sure to stick around. It's about three quarters of the way into the conversation. But we also want to make sure that we plug his, his, his new book, A Man at Arms. Uh, you can pick it up anywhere where books are sold. Uh, whether it's on Amazon, whether it's right there on stephenpressfield.com. And we'll link all of his stuff and all of his information down there in the show notes below. Uh, but without further ado, guys, I don't want to make this too long of an intro because I want you to enjoy today's conversation. I want you to get everything out of it that you can. It was an absolute pleasure to get a chance to meet Stephen. Uh, had an amazing conversation and looking forward to just a new relationship in my life. You know, we, we spoke a little bit after uh, the conversation and he's somebody that I'm definitely going to be leaning into and allowing to speak more into me as I continue on this pursuit in my life with helping you, know, helping you and supporting you and all of your, uh, all of your journeys and, and, and everything that you're trying to create in this world. So let's get on to today's conversation, guys. Battling the inner war of arts with Stephen Pressfield. We love you guys and enjoy. Frank, it's Stephen. Great Thanks for having me. Yeah, welcome, welcome to the Superhuman Life. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited and um, to, to be honest here, slight, slight starstruck, starstruck. Uh, which I haven't really had up up, up <laughs> to this point. Um, you know, your your book, The War of Art, I first read it back in 2017. Um, at that time, I was making a career transition. I'd been an entrepreneur, you know, running a, a, a ticket brokerage, and I was getting into fitness publishing, I guess would, would probably be the best way to explain what I was doing. So I was writing ebooks and I was building programs and, and getting into the online marketing space. And 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 in preparation for today, went back and reread it again. And I believe that we're here for the audience, but a part of this conversation is, is really for me because I've stepped into a new, a new realm, a new space. Um, so selfishly, I'm <laughs> gonna kind of gear this a little bit towards, towards myself. I hope, I hope everybody's okay with that. And I think in doing that, we'll, we'll unlock a great ideas for, for everybody. Um, but you know, you're, you're the, the prime example of it's, it's, it's never too late to get started. You know, I've, I've, I've heard you talk about, you know, this 30 year overnight success, you know, the real epitome of, of you're never told to really, to really step into, to your calling. And when, when, when I look back over your life and, and doing your research, I mean, born in Trinidad, growing up in New York, Duke University, Marine Corps, advertising, copywriting, school teacher, t tractor trailer, bartender, oil field, uh, mental hospital, you know, fruit packer. And, 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 and then now you're so well known for, for all this fiction work that you're doing. Uh, you know, where I think I want to start is, you know, who was Steven growing up, like, like in high school? Like, how would you, you know, which, which one of these, these careers, which one of these lives were you most <laughs> like growing up? Um, I was just a regular kid in high school, you know, was kind of a regular nerd, you know? Uh, yeah. Um, you know, just really like everybody else. I didn't have any ambitions to be a writer or any clue that my life would unfold in the way that it did. Um, I just was uh, sort of tr living it out other people's expectations of what I should be, you know, mm. um, like everybody else. Um, and uh, that sort of got derailed kind of early by life. And then I thrashed around for a long time before I finally sort of came back to, you know, um, where I should have been at the start. Yeah. Yeah. So I know, I know you, you know, like you, you had multiple attempts at, at, at writing your first novel, you know, when did that real kind of breakthrough idea for you uh, come through that you wanted, you know, you wanted to be a writer. Um, you mean, when did the first idea that I should do that? How like, did that yeah. That you was, should. That, that, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I've, uh, when I, I was working in advertising in New York at, at Benton and Bowles, which is a big ad agency. And I was like a young junior copywriter. 
23 years old or something like that, freshly married, et cetera. And I had a boss named Ed Hannibal who, who wrote a novel, quit, wrote a novel, and it was a hit. And like overnight, the guy was a success. Mm. He was famous. And so I said to myself, well, shit, why don't I do that too? How hard could it be? So that mm. was how that was how I first started. But yeah, and of course, that was a total crash and burn scenario. But um, that was the first time that kind of idea occurred to me. And then it, it failed so miserably and my life kind of went off the rails so far that I just sort of out of general shame, I felt like I've got to complete this one way or another, you know, I've, I can't, mm. you know, so that sort of kept me, kept me going for a few years trying to do that. And by that, so that was, I actually had come to love it, you know, and I had come to feel like this is what I want to do, even though I'm failing, failing, failing at it. I, I, I want to keep working at it until I can do it. Were you a, were you a, were you a good copywriter? Was that, was that where maybe, you know, the, no. um, <laughs> no, okay. No, I was terrible. So not, a, I, was, I was mediocre, you know, no, there's not, I, I can't claim it. I will not tell you anything I ever did. No, I was not a good copywriter. Got it. Got it. So, so not a good copywriter, an idea in, in your early twenties to write a novel. And then it wasn't until 17, 20, you know, or 20 plus years later, that, yeah, that the first three or 54 before my first novel actually came out. Wow. So, you know, without, without taking up all of the time here, you know, from can, can you, can you kind of take the audience from that first failure, you know, and, and, you know, maybe kind of pull out some, some of the key pivotal moments in your life to, to the launching of that first novel. Okay. Let's see if I can do this and make it helpful. Um, the first one, I just sort of, a. Uh, I got like one inch from the end and I blew it up. Self-destruction, you know, mm. uh, which I'm sure you, you know, the equivalent of addiction, whatever you want to call it, blew it up. Yeah. Um, then uh, those various jobs that you cited, I just sort of, I kind of fell out of the bottom of the middle class, you know, and I was sort mm. of in the, those kind of jobs that you get where, where all you have to do is show up and have a pulse and you, and you get the job, you know, and, mm -hmm. but all through this, I kept trying to write novels. I would, I would go to back, go back to work, save money, save enough, you know, for like a couple of years, and then quit. Write a novel. Nobody would buy it. Nobody couldn't publish it. I did that like three times, and then finally, I sort of uh, gave up on that and decided to try to uh, to go to Hollywood, try to be a screenwriter. And over like about a fifteen year period, I, I managed to have like a real B level career, C level career. Okay. But what what was good about it was I finally actually started making money as a writer. And I could actually call myself a writer, even though I wasn't doing anything good there either. But but I also was learning what a story was. And by that time I was maybe, I don't know, 53 or 54 years old. So I've been trying to do this for like 30 years. But at that time I did feel like I was a pro. I knew how to sit down. I knew how to handle defeat. I knew how to handle success. I knew what a story was. And at that time, I finally did break through with a novel. And after that, I've just sort of kept going with that. So it was, it was no miraculous thunderbolt or anything. It was just kind of a long um, progression through fail, succeed a little, fail again, succeed a little, get a little bit better, that kind of thing. Yeah, no, that um, that whole you know like job, job, job for a pulse, you know that kind of that kind of rings so you know so so true to me. I mean, just you know looking over, you know, I I I think growing up we kind of look around, you know, our environments, our families, and you know we 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 kind of see or we don't see you know real people pursuing you know pursuing their dreams or or pursuing any 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 type of goals, and you know that's that's kind of where you know where where I came from. Like nobody really talked about ambition or drive or, you know, starting a business or, or chasing your dreams. It's kind of like, you know, I got a job, uh, uh, I hate it, you know, and I, I, I guess, was that kind of your similar thing, you know, gr growing up, like where, where they're not a real, you know, where you're not really surrounded with, with a lot of ambition and drive, like in, in your family. And if so, how were you able to, you know, over the course of, of 20 plus years, maintain that to where, you know, cause you see a lot of guys, you know, thirties and forties and, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but they just, not giving up, but it, but it feels like that. Like they're kind of just 
operating in, in yeah, existence. No, so I'm just, I'm just really curious, like how you were able to, you know, two, two years save up and then take the time away. And then, and then two years, because I can't really imagine there was a lot of people supporting you in this, like where, like where, where was that coming from? You know, it's, it's a great question, Frank, because I asked myself that too, you know, why, you know, but I, I really didn't have any time I would try to kind of go straight, you know, get a job, just be, try to be just a regular person. I would be like so depressed at the end of the day that I just knew I, I just couldn't do it, you know? And I would wind up, I would always be writing something. I'd wind up at the end of the day going home and writing something for a couple hours, or I'd go into the office on a weekend and I'd just work all weekend long on some story, some novel, something I was working on. But um, definitely like what you said, Frank, when I grew up, Everybody in my family, my uncles, my dad, and all of the grown-ups that I knew had regular jobs. You know, they were like in business and, you know, they wore suits and they went to offices. And that was like sort of the given. That was what you were supposed to do, right? But there was nobody, no role models. I didn't have any entrepreneurs in my family or anybody that, that I knew. And in fact, in those days, not many, very many people did that. Um, um, so. It, it For me, it was just sort of a process of over that long haul, you know, you meet one person that's kind of entrepreneurial or one person that's an mm -hmm. artist that's really following. You think, oh, wow, I'd love to do that, you know, and you learn a little yeah. bit from them. Then you meet another and another and another mm -hmm. and, and little by little. But uh, it, for me, it was a whole reinvention of what my family expected of me over over years and years, incrementally over years and years. Got it. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm so fortunate to, you know, have been put in, in places and, and around the right type of people. I mean, my, my life and everything that I've, I've really done has been a direct result of the influence of, of mentors and guides and, and coaches. So I'm curious with you, but I just want to make sure, you know, anybody listening, like we're, we're not, I'm not knocking anybody that's got a quote unquote regular job. Like we need everything. We need, you know, the suit and ties. We need, you know, everybody. And, and, and one of the quotes that really, stood out to me in in your book is our job in this lifetime is not to shape ourselves into some ideal we ought to be but to find who we already are and become it and if you were you know if, if you were created to be an executive or or even a janitor like you know like I, i've talked about this over and over again i ran a i ran a marketing agency back in 2019 and, and and we had a graphic designer who was struggling with with his own identity and i was like carlos like you're you are the designer. Like we were, you know, we were advertising and marketing for some million dollar brands. And I said, your work is the first thing people see. And it, and, and, and it really spoke to him like, wow, okay, I do have meaning in what I'm doing. Cause he was really, you know, struggling with that. So I don't want to make this feel like if, if you're out there and you're not an entrepreneur, you're not a creator that you don't have value in this world because, because I think everybody does as long as it's something that is making you happy. If, if you're showing up nine to five and then you're returning home and it's just complaining and, and, and you hate it, then, then maybe there's something more in, inside of there. So with that, with that mentors and, and influences, were there, were there key individuals, you know, in your life that, that really spoke, you know, spoke to you and, and, and who were some of those, who were some of those early mentors for you? Um, yeah. You know, I've been thinking about this a, a lot lately, Frank, and I think like I've probably had like a hundred mentors over the course of my life and they've all been important. Everybody in a, in a certain way, you know, kind of helping me um, or a lot of people, didn't even realize they were mentors, you know, they were just friends or just somebody that would kind of guide you along the way. Um, I, uh, I told this story on another podcast, so forgive me if I'm, <laughs> you know, if, uh, no, no. But, um, when I was, this was, this was a great sort of mentor experience for me. When I was driving, I was driving trucks in North Carolina many moons ago, and I was definitely um, on my own sort of, internal odyssey you know and i kept fucking up i kept dropping loads and you know just you know really just i i was just fighting demons like mad and my my boss was a dispatch the dispatcher his name is hugh reeves and uh he had hired me and one time he, he called me into his office and he you know sat me down and he was like 20 years older than me and um he was a former marine he had like a you know a buzz cut type of thing and he said to me uh he said, son, I, I don't know what your internal world is like, and I don't know what kind of odyssey you're going through. And he said, and I don't want to know. 
He says, but this company here is a business. We're in business to make money. And you represent this country. And when I give you a load to deliver, you better deliver that fucking load, you know? And if you can't figure out how, figure it out one way or another. He says, but we are in business here to make money. And uh, so that was kind of like one of those moments where you get, you know, you get slapped across the face and you come back to reality. And I say, wow, that's, wow, okay. Uh, you know, I'm so sorry, you know? I'm, I'm <laughs> like that. But that was like a great, you know, mentor moment to me. And I think it, it almost applies across the board to anything we're trying to do. I mean, what he was articulating to me was, you know, we're this is a professional operation and you better be a goddamn professional if you're doing it. No, I love that and it's it it it, it runs parallel with something that 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 one a mentor gave gave to me and it's, you know, how you do one thing is is how you do everything. You know, if 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 if, you know, and and he talks about when they're, you know, this this guy runs a multinational uh, franchise organization and in their interviews they will actually send somebody out to the out to the interviewer's car and look at the interior of the car through the window. And it's like, okay, if you can't wow, keep your car great. clean, if there's if there's great. empty bottles and, and just paper and trash <laughs> everywhere, like you're not a fit for this organization. Because yeah, yeah, how you do yeah. everything, how you do one thing is how you do is how you do everything. So so I love that. Um, oh, that's great. I love that too. Yeah, let's um, you know, let's 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 jump into you know resistance. You know, I you. You published the, the the first book, you know, in 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 ninety five, and then you know seven years later, you come out with with the War of Art. So I think the first question is: Is the War of Art the book that young Stephen needed for twenty seven years? Uh -huh. Like, was this was 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 the goal in writing this? Like, to you know, was it was it more of a because the work that I do now is it, it, it's a product of of my own journey and own transformation and and overcoming you know my own you said demons overcoming my demons in in my life. I now feel equipped to to help others. Um, but I also want to be that person for Frank, you know, 15 years ago. Like, that's really what I think about, you know, when I flip the camera on or, or, or when I create any content is like, I'm speaking to the younger version of myself. So was writing this book, was it really written for, for the younger Steven? It, it really was, except the interesting thing, Frank, was if I had had that book, if somebody had put that book in my hands 20 years earlier, it would have gone right over my head. You know, mm. it would not have sunk in at all. I wouldn't have gotten it because I just wasn't ready, you know? But yes, definitely when I wrote that book, I sort of wrote it for myself in a way, just kind of, you know, speaking to myself. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and like I told you, I originally read it back in, back in 2017 and, and then rereading it uh, here, here last week. Like, I got, like I, it, it, it spoke to me so differently. Like I, and, and this is what I love about books because I think where you're at in life, you know, the season that you're in, what you're going through like you can reread the book the same book every single year you know obviously you know if the book is garbage like you know read it once <laughs> or read it halfway through and get rid of it uh but there's a few key ones you know and I, I would put this up there as a as a classic so you know the underlying theme it is 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 obviously this this resistance you know that we all deal with whether we're creative whether we're an entrepreneur or, or whether we're just you know an everyday citizen so um you know can 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 you kind of talk about you know what what is resistance and and you know where where did you kind of kind of find this um, you know, content. I know it's not, you know, I don't think you would take credit for coming up with the, the, the idea of resistance, but you know, where, where did it really come from for you? And, and then what is resistance when you talk about it in the book? Let me turn this back. I will answer that, Frank, but let me turn it back to you. How would, why don't you tell me what resistance is in your life? Yeah. Um, it's funny because I was talking with, I was talking with somebody um, earlier today, a very, a very close friend of mine, and you know, he's a fan of the show. So, so he'll probably hear this and he'll be nodding as I, as I say this, you know, I told you I was, I was somewhat, you know, starstruck with, with getting you on here today. I deal with this every single, every single week. Uh, you know, I will, I will show up a few, a few minutes early and, uh, you know, make sure the lights are set up, make sure that, you know, the mic is in the proper place. Am I standing in between the two photos? Everything look good. Are there boogers hanging out of my nose? Um, but there's always this, there's always this, you know, this, this underlying thought in my head, like, I kind of hope the person doesn't show up. <laughs> you know, like, like, oh, really? Um, yeah. not, not because I don't want to do the conversation, but like almost as a, almost as a way of like, like who, like who, who am I, you know, to, to have these conversations? Who am I to, you know, try to, try to put this out in the world? I mean, these are, these are true real thoughts that I deal with every single right. week. So I think it's, you know, I, I, um, I, I think it's those thoughts. I think it's that, that, that internal doubt, that struggle, uh, that we all, that we all deal with, you know, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm an entrepreneur. I run a few, you know, I run a few different businesses. 
none of them are easy. You know, none of them just kind of, you know, uh, succeed without, without testing. And, you know, I'm in the marketing space. So, you know, test, tweak, test, convert, you know, all uh, like all this stuff. So, um, I think, I think it's just that doubt of like, sh you know, like, why, like, why am I doing this? Like, you know, I see so-and-so, you know, I got a lot of friends that are, that are successful both in the fitness space and in, in the podcasting space. Um, and then you, you know, obviously the world that we live in, you can, you can see anybody's life at the, at the click of a button. So everybody's, you know, the, the highlight reel of, of social media. So I think the comparison, uh, is a form of resistance. Uh, but for me, it's really that, that, that underlying doubt, you know, because I have failed a lot in my life. And, you know, I, like, like we were talking about before, like, I don't come from just a lineage of, uh, winner, you know, winning, like, it's just so, so I've, I've dealt with it my, my entire life. So I know there's a lot of me rambling there, but, but I hope, I hope I made something clear in, in, in what I said. Um, I would say, uh, let me see if I can define resistance with a capital R. Um, one of the things is if you're a writer and you sit down to this thing in the morning, you can feel and looking at a blank screen, right? Or the blank page, you can feel a force radiating off that keyboard in your face that's trying to push you away you know just like if you go to the gym and you stand before on the squat rack you can feel a force radiating off the squat rack saying well maybe i should go get a cheeseburger and not actually do the try to lift this thing you know and and it's you know we have opponents and things that um that we have to fight against in the real world. But resistance is all in here. It's completely self-contained and it's our own uh, self-sabotage. Like when you say, I hope the guest doesn't show up for the podcast, you know, I, I have the same sort of thing. You know, gee, I hope something happens. I don't have to actually sit down and work today. Um, but uh, resistance also takes the form of, as you were saying, Frank, of self-doubt, you know, of the voice that you hear in your head that says, who are you to try to do this thing, this dream that you have, this business you want to start, this book you want to write, this movie you want to write? Who are you? It's been done a million times before, way better than you can do it. You're too old. You're too young. You're too skinny. You're too fat. You're too much of a slob. Your mother was right about you. Your father said you were a bum. They were all completely right. You know, that kind of voice that 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 fills you with uh, with doubt and will and will. Um, try to knock you off your stride to do this. Um, the other aspect of resistance is distractions and shadow careers and addictions. In other words, other avenues that you could go down, other rabbit holes you could go down rather than doing your actual work. And so for me, when I finally gave this force a name, resistance with a capital R, that was a breakthrough for me to be able to overcome it. Well, then when I would sort of hear this voice in my head, instead of believing that it was me having those thoughts, I said, oh, that's not me. That's resistance. That's this force. That's this thing that's there for everybody. And all I have to do is get past it. You know, I just have to sit down and do my work and it'll go away. But it never goes away day to day. You know, every morning it's there. And um, so anyway, that's my definition. Of resistance. No, no, what I would say is to anybody, I think this is an absolute truism to everyone in the world. Before you can do whatever your dream is, you got to find some way to overcome that force. That force will always be there. It's in everybody's head. And you got to find some trick, some mental mindset that will allow you to work in spite of it. Yeah, that's great. It's like what I, what I, what I got out of that, it's like that, that force was there and like, you knew it was there, but it's like the minute you almost personified it by giving it this capital R, it's like, you now were able to kind of see the opponent and, and then tell yourself every day I'm showing up, not to this, like, like force that I can't see, but I can see it. And it's like, now I have like, I have, uh, an enemy, you know, that I'm, that I'm, that I'm going to battle every single day. And that enemy's not going to go away, but because I've given it, you know, this, this personification of resistance with a capital R, I know as long as I continue to show up and I continue uh, to get better and, and, and do the reps. You know, it's funny you use the, you, you use the weightlifting uh, analogy there as well, you know, like standing behind the, you know, standing in front of the squat rack, like, should I do it? Should I do it? Should I do it? I mean, you can see behind me, like fitness has been a massive part of my life. I really feel that's probably an area where I really overcome 
a lot of, you know, a lot of resistance. Like I now, you know, seek a lot of that out. So is it something, you know, I know you said it never, it never goes away, but no, actually one thing I want to, I want to ask you about, because you said addiction and, and shadow careers. I mean, obviously everybody understands what a, what an addiction is. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's the work that I involved in. And, um, you know, I, I talk a lot about, you know, specifically with, you know, with, with porn, it's like, you're, you're escaping, you're escaping reality for, for some, for some reason, you know, wife rejected you, uh, you're unhappy with, with maybe your job, you know, we talked about, about, about some of that earlier. Um, so we all get that, but when you said shadow career, I know that probably, you know, a lot of people didn't really, um, understand, not, not understand, but can, can you just, you know, maybe speak to what a shadow career could be somebody and how does, you know, how does resistance show up okay. in that? Um, by the way, this is in another book of mine called Turning Pro. I don't know if you've read this, okay. Frank. I but have not read that one, no. You, you know, it's, it's, it was the immediate book after the War of Art and kind of just amplifying what was there. And I talk about shadow careers there. But, like, here's an, here's an example. In, in Hollywood, there are it, it, uh, entertainment lawyers, and they are these law firms that represent directors and actors and writers and so on and so forth, right? And when you make a deal to make a movie, your entertainment lawyer draws up the contracts and makes sure everything is good, right? And what I have found talking to my own lawyers and stuff like that is that a lot of them secretly want to be writers or want to be directors. And some of them go on and, and do that and become really good at it. And so for them, the law is sort of is a shadow career. It's like it's adjacent to the career they really wish they could do, right? They're in the entertainment business. They're dealing with actors, et cetera, et cetera. But it's safe. You know, you can go to law school, you get a degree, you get a real job at a real firm, and you're okay, right? You can you buy a house and support your family. And, but it's not the real, your real, real career, right? It's, it's adjacent to it, but it's not real. So there, there are a lot of people, I think, that have, shadow careers, a lot of people who are uh, professors or teaching English, they really want to be writers, right? Mm. But they just can't, you know, and so on and so forth. Well, another way to do that is a lot of times people will work or take jobs as assistants to somebody that they really wish they were doing that thing, right? But for whatever reason, they don't have the confidence or to, to take that leap so they they pick this career that's kind of adjacent to some to somebody right you might work you know picking up the dry cleaning for a a rock and roll guitarist or something like that and you know taking me setting meetings for them and getting their uh, chinese food and all that sort of stuff breaking up with girlfriends for them instead of actually starting a band and doing your thing yeah and that's got to lead to like envy. I mean, like you're, you know, I mean, especially with the rock star analogy, it's like, you're, you know, maybe you're getting a little bit of taste of the life, but it's kind of like you're, you're on, you're on the outside. Like that's, that's just a recipe for, yes. for, for unhappy. Let me jump in and interrupt again. Like Frank before, when I was talking about that, I was an advertising writer. That was mm. a shadow career for me. Like, and when my boss wrote a novel and quit, I immediately said, well, shit, I'm going to do that too. Right. So being an, an advertising writer is a kind of a, it's a way you're sort of a writer, you're kind of working with words, but you're not really taking a chance. You're not really putting anything out there. You get a paycheck, you have a real job, you have dental insurance, you know, so that was, uh, that was definitely a shadow career for me. So, so resistance is this, is this force, whether it's, you know, it's, it's the voice in our head, it's rating off of the keyboard, it's rating, you know, and, and not everybody here is, is listening, is listening is, is, is a writer. So it could even be, you know, you keep saying like, I want to start this business, but I'm, I can't find the time because I got a kid and, you know, I got a, you know, I got 40 hours. So, you know, where do exactly. I find the time? Well, you know, like, so, so that, that is another form, form of resistance. So, so we've defined it, you know, and, and it's never going away. And I think once we, once we realize that, then, then we can become, you know, we can begin to get proactive in doing it. So once we've identified where the resistance is in our life and, you know, how it's holding us back, what are some of the initial steps that, that we can take to kind of, you know, push back or, or work through it? Um, you know, the, I was just talking about this book of mine, Turning Pro. Mm. And, you know, the part two, the middle part of the War of Art is called Turning Pro. and mm -hmm. This was 
this was just what, what worked for me, what got me from being unable to, to follow my calling to being able to follow it, was flipping a switch in my head and deciding for myself that I'm not an amateur anymore. I'm going to be a pro. And there, that's like a, an incredible divide between those two mindsets, right? If you're, if you're thinking as an amateur, when you run into adversity, you're going to fold, right? If you have any sort of issue, it's like an athlete playing hurt, right? A pro knows he's never going to be, or she is never going to be perfectly fit. There's always something wrong, right? But a pro plays hurt, you know, and that's just part of it. Um, obviously, you don't play when you're really injured because you're going to make it. But, you know, um, and a pro shows up every day. A pro is in it for the long haul and is in it for keeps. A pro is not dabbling. A pro is not a weekend warrior. A pro is not fucking around, you know. A pro is in it all the way. So uh, for me, the idea of like turning pro in your mind is 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 the it was the key for me and it doesn't mean that you have to say to yourself oh i'm only working for money from now on because usually when you go to follow your dream nobody gives you any money anyway <laughs> um, but but at least you think of yourself as now i'm i'm a professional you know i'm not i'm not going to when adversity strikes i'm not going to fold i'm going to keep going just like a pro would yeah, I love the I love the story that you that that you tell in the book. It's not a story, maybe it's 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 more of a quote you're referencing. And and I, I can't I don't I don't I, I can't recall his name right now. But he's asked, uh, you know, do you do you only write when when inspiration strikes? And you're like, uh, right. yeah. Or or he goes or he goes, yeah. But but inspiration strikes every morning at at nine a.m. And that's exactly what you're saying here. It's like you put it in your schedule. You get down. You know, you you set the time. You set the appointment. Even if you're just sitting there at a at a blank screen for for an hour. Eventually, if you show up every day, something will come out. That's exactly right. And, and another thing here, Frank, is like a lot of times an amateur's mindset is something like, well, if I'm in the mood, I'll do it, you know, mm. or I'll do the work. Or you, you, or if you're, you're faced with a choice, you say, well, I'm not really in the mood for doing this, you know, so I'm not going to do it. That's a complete amateur loser's way of looking at it. And I lived that way for a, a long time. But the difference with a pro, how you feel doesn't matter, mm. doesn't count, right? You got to do your thing, and uh, no matter how you feel, um, I don't know if you remember Joni Benoit. If this rings a bell, she was the first American women's marathon winner in the Olympic Games in 1984. Joni Benoit, and they did it, and she was sponsored by Nike, and she lived in Maine. And Nike did one of those great commercials that they always do, where it's like 4.30 in the morning, uh, she's in bed, it's totally dark, the radio is playing and it says, you know, welcome to Bangor, Maine, temperature is 10 degrees below zero, it's going down to 50, below, whatever, right? And you just see her get up, get on her shoes, get on her stuff, and go out into the dark and it's incredibly cold. And that's a professional, right? If she was lying in bed saying, look, I just don't feel like it. I'm not in the mood, you know? Um, that's the amateur way to look at it. And, uh, you know, she won the uh, gold medal. Yeah, yeah. So so showing up no matter what, you know, as long as it's on your calendar in your appointment. Another thing I've heard you, you know, kind of speak to is is this idea or concept of, you know, little little successes. And, uh, you know, for me, like with the, with the guys that I work with, it's like, uh, you know, if you're struggling, like we got to like, you know, we're, we're rebuilding your life. And, you know, for me, I think it starts from the moment that you wake up. Like I, I did an entire 40 minute podcast where I literally stood here and screamed into the microphone, like stop hitting, you know, stop hitting the snooze button on your life. Because I, I, I think a it's, it's, you're just pausing your life. And it's also, you know, I, I believe that our self-confidence is directly tied to our ability to keep the promises that we make to ourselves, you know, and, and by snoozing, you're literally saying no to that first promise that, that you make. So when you talk about this idea of, of, of little successes, like, is that a way for you to, you know, maybe build, build some momentum towards the moment of, of writing or, or, or creative? Like, is that, is that kind of the idea behind it? Exactly. Yeah. And I actually got this from my friend Randy Wallace, who was a, who wrote Braveheart, 
and has done directed oh, wow. things. And this is kind of his concept that I, uh, and um, it's like from the minute he gets up, he's looking ahead to the moment when he's got to either start writing or start directing or start doing something. And that's, you know, a couple hours away, a few hours away. And so between now and then, he's trying to put together a string of little successes to kind of get momentum going. You know, he's a guy who, he actually works out with Laird Hamilton, the surfer, you know, oh, the big wow. wave yeah. surfer, where they do that stuff where it's, they're actually in Laird's swimming pool underwater, holding their breath and doing, you know, whatever, lifting weights. But so, um, oh, that's cool. But he even counts, Randy even counts like brushing his teeth. He calls that a little success, you know, getting dressed is a little success, having a little breakfast. Because, but he's aiming for that moment. So he's trying to get momentum going. And by the time he's finished working out, take a shower, he can look and he say to himself, wow, you know, I've already had a, a great day already, you know, and then he has momentum going. But I just want to say one thing for anybody who's listening to this. Because I may sound as I'm talking like this, like I've got it knocked and I know what I'm doing. But I'm in the middle of a tremendous fight with resistance right now. It's really kicking my ass. And I've had to, like, over the last... Even just the last three days, I've been to do just what you just what you're saying, Frank. I've been to say I have got to get up at a certain time. I've been I've allowed myself to get slack, you know. I've sloughed off, I've fucked off, and I've, I'm and I'm sort of trying to put it together, you know, one minute at a time, one day at a time, and get back into into a groove that I need to be in. And one of the things I'm telling myself is that, you know, it takes a month, as you know, to form a new habit. And I've mm. I've fallen into a bad habit. And so I'm just thinking each day, I'm going to try to a building block of each day to, to get back into, into a groove that I've fallen out of. So I'm not immune to any of this stuff by any means, even after 50 years of doing this shit. No. And, 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 and thank you for, for sharing that. I mean, you know, we talked about it when, when we were first brought up, brought up resistance, like it never, you know, it never goes away. And, you know, I, I actually have a podcast, you know, uh, one of our recent episodes two weeks ago, I had uh, the great Dr. Caroline Leaf, who was one of the leading researchers in, in neuroplasticity, which is the ability, uh -huh. you know, to change your brain and then the mind body connection. And you said there, you know, it takes a month. Uh, her latest research is actually showing it's three cycles of 21 minimum. So actually 63 days uh, to develop wow. that habit, and actually hardwire it in, in, into your brain. And, you know, talking about these little wins and, and little successes, a lot of what we, what we do here is, is built around neuroscience and, you know, just kind of talking about Dopamine, you know, dopamine is that feel good chemical, like when we're in pursuit of our goals, when we're in the pursuit of doing something that we've set for ourselves, that's when we get those little dopamine hits. So by creating those little, you know, those little successes or those little wins, like brushing your teeth, like it sounds funny, like I'm going to acknowledge myself as a win, you're actually giving yourself a dopamine hit and it's a feel good chemical. So you, you kind of turn on the positive emotions. So it, you know, we can talk about it from, from the idea, but it's, you know, if you take it a layer deeper, it's 100% supported by, by neuroscience. So, so I absolutely, I absolutely well, love that. And, like and, that. <laughs> There's something behind it. <laughs> yeah. So, um, this is a quote I can't, you know, I, I heard it a few, uh, a few weeks ago and it just kind of like, it just kind of struck me when I, when I heard it and, and I wasn't able to get the original source of it. Uh, but there's a quote out there that, that tells us that three things that every man should do during his time on earth is plant a tree, have a son and write a book because all of them will outlast us. Ah. Um, so as we're, you know, as we're, as we're talking about, you know, this, this resistance and it holds us back from, yeah, from a creative view. What's wrong with that? <laughs> do, do, do you feel we all have, you know, something creative, like, inside of us absolutely i think everybody's got it absolutely it doesn't and it doesn't have to be in the in the sort of a mainstream thing like make a movie or create a business or something like that i think i think a, a mother that raises her, her kids you know mm. um somebody that that helps the uh people who are weaker than they are more oppressed than they are somebody that helps get out the vote you know there are so many things that are uh that i would call art or that are the same thing um, and I, I, I think we're all born, absolutely all born with, with some kind of a destiny. And, you know, just, I want to say one thing about, uh, what you were talking about, about addictions, Frank. I think that, uh, to me, and again, I'm not a doctor, so I don't, don't take, but it, when looked at from the point of view of resistance, 
anytime you see somebody having an addiction, and I've had my own versions of these, you know, that is that energy, creative energy, being channeled in the wrong way. It's like a shadow career. But the good news of it is, is that that energy that's going into the addiction, and it's a tremendous amount of energy, right? I mean, just to score whatever illegal substances you have, it's, you know, or whatever it is. If, if somebody's got that energy, that's a tremendous sign. If they could only, mm. it's better than having no energy, you know? It's, it's maybe it's a negative thing, but at least it's a powerful negative thing. So if, if somebody, I, I think there's, there's really no way, I don't think, to kick an addiction unless that energy gets channeled into something else, you know, because that energy is not going to go away. And so the question is, what is your dream? What is it that you really want to do? What is it that you're really afraid of, that you're afraid of doing, that you're afraid of failing at, or afraid of succeeding at? And, and I think most people will have that answer like that. They, they'll cover it over, they'll make excuses for it, but they'll know it right like that. And, and, and I don't think you can get out of a, a, a negative flow unless you get into a positive flow. Oh, that's so, so, so true, you know, and, and, and one of the, you know, one of the big, I guess, you know, deep underlying philosophies of, of my entire company, you know, it's rebuilt recovery is, is, is how I've named it. And it's, you know, our, our symbol is a, a Phoenix with a lion's face on it. You know, Phoenix is a symbol of death and rebirth and then stepping into the lion that's living inside of you. And one of the things that I say all the time is it's, 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 you're running from, you know, you're running from the life that you've put together for yourself, whatever it is, you know, you're, you're escaping reality. But my goal is to help you become that man that you were created to be. Like find that deep burning desire living inside of you and let's unlock it and let's harness all of this, you know, for me, it's sexual energy that is being, you know, basically just, just waste. I know you have an entire, you know, there's, there's a chapter in your book on, on sex and, and, and resistance, but we need to harness this sexual energy because God, I believe it's so true. You know, just, just thinking about it, like, you know, when you, when you, uh, watch porn and masturbate you know the the end result is is half of the equation for what in my what in my opinion is is the greatest creation on on earth which is another human being so if you could learn to harness that and then direct it into a creative outlet you know for me it was really launching this podcast i mean that this came you know months after um i was able to kind of kind of break my own demons and then you said something there too about you know the addictions really leading to or or really being a a a a product of super creative and i and and this is probably why we see such a high level of of addiction like in the hollywood space i mean you were in hollywood for for a very long time you know you see these comedians these artists these these rock stars athletes that you know maybe hit a little bit of of success and then they just spiral spiral down and sometimes never never get out of it it's 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 because they have all that creative energy and they just haven't harnessed it and, and put it into into the right outlet. Yeah. I mean, or they'll, you know, I don't, I'm not a doctor. I don't want to psychoanalyze anybody, but um, when somebody like a comedian or a star of some kind or another is, is, has success, like uh, um, you can be sure that they have a tremendous, if you want to call it sexual force, life force, eros, whatever it is from the first chakra, you know, that, that, that's, that's making them, that's giving them the energy to do that. And what happens usually is, you know, they attract these hangers on that who are people in their own shadow career that will try to tempt them with this, you know, the fruits of their, you know, whatever it is. And it's it's resistance again, because it's so hard to keep doing it, the good stuff, right, to keep facing those demons. that it's real easy to take a little off ramp off the freeway and next thing you know, you're down a rabbit hole. Yeah. So talked about distractions. I mean, have, 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 have you noticed like, a an incline in, in resistance, you know, with, with social media, I mean, social media is, is by far the, the biggest distraction, you know, the human race has ever had, had to deal with and it's, and it's, it's not going anywhere. So, um, have you seen an incline and in, in, in what's maybe, you know, if, if there's a piece of advice to somebody out there, like, you know, put your phone in a lockbox, like, you know, um, obviously being, a, being a professional, like, like, how are you dealing with, with distractions these days in, in today's world, you got, you know, unlimited channels, Netflix, you know, and, and, and all of this. So, 
So what are some, you know, if, if there's any strategies or, or tips or tactics to deal with some of these distractions? I mean, it, it is like the whole internet with the algorithms is just designed <laughs> to distract you and distract you again and again and again, right? Yeah. And uh, so for me, the only way to handle it is to just put it in, you know, put it in a lockbox somewhere, you know, at least while you're working. You know, when you close the door to do whatever it is you're going to do, um, don't bring the phone in there. You know, don't have any, you know, because we're human, we'll be distracted. You know, it's just uh, a thing that's so terrible about the Internet, aside from being distracting, is that it's all so superficial. It's all at the absolute surface level. Right. And if we're ever going to work or accomplish anything, you're going to do something with a podcast. If somebody's going to do something as a bodybuilder or as, as a gym, the, the, the key to it all is working at depth, right? Staying in there long enough that you really get deep, right? I always say that um, in music or in writing or anything like that, hour one, you only get so deep. Hour two, you get deeper. There's a very big difference between hour four and hour one. And what the internet does is it keeps us at minute one or even second one, you know, we never get deep. And it, it creates this terrible habit. Not that there aren't good things. I mean, we're doing this podcast. Theoretically, that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it is. Hopefully people are listening and maybe picking something up out of this. So it's not all bad. But, you know, you can't keep watching podcasts and wasting an hour here and an hour there, and, you know, just because it's interesting. Again, a yeah, professional and would do that. An amateur would. Yeah. And that, 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 that was, that, that was me for, for years. I was a, you know, I was, I was one of these, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to buy every course. I'm going to attend every event. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to join this group. I'm going to listen to this podcast. And you can see behind me, I mean, um, I have, I have quite a question of, second, of books right. and self-development. Yeah. Let me interrupt you for a second. When you were doing that and I've done that too, that's another form of a shadow career, mm. right? It's not really a career, but it's like, well, I'm not really, starting the business but i'm going to a seminar about starting a business right and we say oh well mm. it's working you know it's sort of like in the writing world it's that's what research is but you say well i can't really start to write the book yet i got to do three months of research and meanwhile you're doing you know a year later you still haven't started the book oh wow yeah i mean it's 100% so true, but, but here's, here's, here's like the catch 22 of that, because in that, in, in that period of time frame is where I met Mo, you know, and, yeah. and, and Mo is connected to you and I, so, so, so we may not be here and, and, you know, that like I've, I've, I've pivoted and, and transitioned, you know, obviously, you know, not, not making us all about me. I had to overcome once again, my own, you know, my own demons for me, the biggest resistance in, in my life for, for 20 years was that addiction to, to pornography. Um, so I, I mean, I want to put a, you know, I want to put a button on, on resistance in, in, and as we're bringing it home, just, you know, ask you, ask you a couple of questions, you know, maybe about Steven, Steven himself. Um, is there anything that we've, you know, that, that we've left off or any, you know, any, any, any parting words on, on addiction? You know, like I said, we, you know, we have a, you know, we have a, a male audience. There are going to be some online fitness entrepreneurs that are, you know, in the early stages of, of launching and, and, and building their careers. So um, anything that we haven't talked about on, on resistance that, that we can kind of share here with, with the audience? Well, there's a lot, but let, let me just say for a second, uh, off the top of my head, addiction to porn. Now, I'm, I haven't had that, so I don't know about that. But one of the things that I believe about addictions is <clears throat> that, and shadow careers too, is that they're metaphors for our real, for our real calling. Meaning, like, for instance, an addiction to porn, in my opinion, is porn is about sex, right? It's about the, the, the uh, life force, eros, mm. right? The, 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 the force that dwells in the first chakra. And so it's really a metaphor for being, um, for following a dream, for being an entrepreneur, for having a big vision, and then in a male sense, going after it, you know? So I think that's a lot of times when we have an addiction or a shadow career, it's a metaphor for what we really should be doing. It's like the shadow version of what we really should be doing. 
So sometimes I think that can help us. We can, if we can say to ourselves, well, what is this, this bullshit that I'm doing? What is it a metaphor for? What is it kind of symbolic of? What would be the real thing that I should do? You know, like for me, in a way, when I was driving trucks and I used to drive and even beyond trucks, I just, I put like 300 and some thousand miles on my old Chevy van, right? That was my, that was about progress. It was, that was the metaphor. Mm. It was like, oh, I'm driving down the road. I've done 50,000 miles. I've done 100,000. I've done 300,000. But it was completely empty, right? Because, but what it really meant was I, I just, I wanted to make progress. I wanted to go somewhere. I wanted to, you know, I, want, I was ambitious. I wanted to go somewhere because I found this, this much safer, easy, fake way to do it. And it was, so that's the one thing I want to say about addictions and things like that. No, that is, I mean, so great. I mean, I, as I, my, 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 my wheels are just, just spinning here and it's like, um, never, you know, never looked at it in, in, in that lens or that perspective. I think are not necessarily, are not a bad thing. I mean, obviously you should stay in them and they're bad, but they're yeah. a good sign because it's a sign of, of life force and of mm. some sort of aggressive energy going out into the world. If it can just be channeled yeah. in the right way, it'll save everything. Yeah. And, and I mean, just, 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 you know, bringing it back to here, I talked about, you know, we, we had Dr. Caroline Leith and, you know, we were addressing a little bit of, of the addiction, you know, for years, all addictions kind of got this bad rap, you know, mental health disease, you know, disorder, you need this pill or, or this or that. And, and, and she's like, no, it should really be, and you're, you're saying the same thing here. It should be like a, like a trigger sign, a, a warning that, that something is off. And if you, if you look at it, you know, if you, if you, if you go into the darkest part of the forest, that's where, that's where the gold is, is, is to be found. Yeah. Um, so, so that is so, well, so true. Right. And, and, um, wow, that's great. So, um, I love that. Wow. All right. Well, just, you know, just, just kind of bringing things home here. You know, you, um, as I, as I look at, at, at the books that you've written, I mean, there's, there's just so many great, great novels here. I mean, um, I have a question though. It's because your, your original novel was about a golf, you know, it was a golf story. Um, and then outside of one other book, it really feels like everything has been based around, you know, the, the, the ancient world, uh, military, war, et cetera, et cetera. Like, um, where did, like, where did, I, I guess, where did, um, the desire, not desire, but, you know, is, is this because you were, you were, you're in the Marines or, or, or is there some, you know, some other explanation on, on why well, you've, you know, uh, pursued I this? I mean, I, and this, I'm sure you, you agree with me on this. I can tell already. I see life as a battle. I see it as a war. When we're talking about resistance, it's a war against that force in our head. You know, there are external forces too, but it's a war against that. And so that I think is why I'm drawn to these kind of stories of war about the ancient Spartans or Alexander the Great or whatever. And can I get in a plug for a book here while we're on the air? Absolutely. Please do. Yes. This is, this is my newest book. It's called A Man at Arms. It just came out like two weeks ago. It's a novel and it's really good. And I just want to put a plug in for it. Um, but that, again, is another sort of, I consider myself a man at arms, even though I'm not, mm. I don't have a sword, I don't have a gun, but I'm fighting this war in here and this war against, you know, resistance and shadow careers and addictions and all that. So, um, and the hero in this book is doing the same thing, but in the physical world. So that, that's why I, I, I think why I write about it. Yeah, that's great. That's great. No, well, we're, we're, we're going to plug all of your stuff, Stephen, here, here at the end and, and, and in the show notes. I mean, obviously that book's available on, on Amazon. I mean, you prefer them to buy it Amazon on, on your site. I know it's in bookstores as, as, as well. Um, as, as you're saying that, like has, has, have, have your novels in, in, in your career, has it been, you know, um, like a timeline of, of your own life, like, like filtered into your stories. Are there, is, is Steven in, in every single one of them, or, or is this kind of a rare, rare case with the man at arms? You know, maybe on some level, Frank, but, but really, um, really, no, it's not like uh, I'm putting events from my real life into anything. No, not at all. I think that's, you know, 
I'm a believer that stories and songs exist on another level before mm. we bring them forth on this level, on the material plane. And so as, as a writer, I'm sort of trying to tune into the cosmic radio station and find out that, that, that story that's out there that wants me to tell it. And then I kind of put myself at the service of that story and, and try, to, try to bring it forth. Like you might put yourself at the service of a client that you're, you're trying to, you know, enter into that, you know, with compassion and with empathy, enter into their struggle and help them, you know, bring it to a happy conclusion. That's what I'm trying to do with a story. So I'm, I'm no, I'm not like telling my own story. No. Got it. It's a great, great answer. Spiritual answer. Um, this has been, this is, this has been, I mean, this has been incredible for, for me, for, for the audience. Um, I hope, I hope you enjoyed it as, as well. Um, I want to, I want to quote you one more time from, from the war of art, if, if you don't mind. Uh, and, and this is to everybody listening, you know, we talked about it. Everybody has something rest and creative in, inside of them. You know, um, I believe, you know, that, that, that we were created in, in, in God's image. And, you know, with that, I mean, God created, created everything. So, so just knowing that like you were put on this earth to create in, and you, I mean, I, I don't know what your, you know, your, your, your spiritual beliefs are, but creative work is not a selfish act or a bid for attention on the part of the actor. It's a gift to the world and every being in it. Don't cheat us on your contribution. Give us what you've got. And, and that was something that was highlighted from the first time I read it. And I went back in, I just read it and, and, and it, it's, it's, it's folded over now in the book. And, and I believe that tr to be true. So everybody that's, that's, that's listening to this conversation, I hope he, hope he gave you something here. I hope, you know, that, uh, there was some inspiration in, in inside of this, and you know, I, I I try to like like I said with you know with the work that I do and, and all of my guys, it's it's like let's remove this this resistance of pornography in your life. And let's help you step into the man that you were created to be. So as we're bringing it home here, Stephen, um, you know, I have have a couple questions that we always like to to last at the end. Obviously, we talked about your your latest book. We talked about something that you're 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 working on now that you have a lot of resistance. So are you able to share anything on 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 this new project on? Um, that, that you're working on is a little too early in this. Okay. I believe when you're working on something, you don't want to talk about Got it. Got it. Okay. 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 Amazing. Um, well, outside of, of, of all your books, I mean, are, is, is, is there, are there any other books? Um, I'm, like I said, I'm a huge, huge fan of reading and, and, and knowledge. Um, any other books besides yours that have had a major impact on your life? I only read my own. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's a lot, but, um, you know, it's, I'll recommend one, and this might seem like a really strange book to recommend, um, but I'll do it anyway for whatever it's worth. It's a yeah. Penguin paperback called The Last Days of Socrates. And what this is, is if you remember Socrates at the end of his life, he was convicted by a jury of poisoning the minds, and he was sentenced to death by hemlock, right? He had to drink the hemlock and die. And um, Plato, who was one of the greatest writers of all time, was Socrates, like younger brother type of guy. And he was with him, like at his shoulder, through this whole period. And when Socrates was in the cell, you know, and he was held in the cell for like a month or more before they uh, finally actually had him drink the hemlock, his friends were allowed to visit. And they visited him every day. And Plato visited him every day. And so he wrote. Plato wrote these four dialogues that are collected in this little book. And what it's really about is like Socrates, you figure one of the deepest thinkers, one of the greatest philosophers that ever lived, and he's about to die. And it's what he was saying and what he was thinking, mm. how he looked on his own death. And, and it, it really, uh, and it's written in dialogue form. It's written like person A says something, person B says something. You know, it's like a movie. So um, I don't know why I'm recommending it, Frank. It just popped into my head. But it's a great thing on the subject of death and how, which it's just, we may think we're not thinking about death, but we are at all times, you know. We're always aware that we're mortal and, mm. you know, um, how do we make the most of our life, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is one of the, the greatest philosophers of all time talking on that subject when he himself was at the brink of death. And it's all true. So anyway, I recommend that it's it's cheap too. It's only like four bucks or something. The last days yeah. of Socrates. 
no, that's that's amazing. That's definitely one that 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 I'm gonna pick up. Not that I'm you know anywhere near the level of, of, of any of these guys or even even the great thinkers of of today. But I maybe I like to kind of look at myself as a not a deep thinker, but but I but I you know I I love I love philosophy, and I think it was Socrates who talks about that internal daemon, and that was his voice. It didn't yeah. tell him what to do, but it told him what not to do. Almost. Yeah his own variation of, of resistance. Like if he, if he wanted to do something, he would consult with his daemon and it was like, should I do this or should I don't? And if the daemon said no, then he knew that, that, you know, it, it, yeah. it, it always told him not, not what not to do. Yeah. Um, so just kind of, kind of bringing it all home here with, 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 with the theme of today's uh, conversation. So, so Stephen, once again, you know, thank, thank, thank you for, for your time here today. Like I said, I know this conversation is going to help a lot of people. It, it helped myself if it, if it doesn't help anybody else, but I know our, our listeners are going to get a lot out of this. So, we know we have the man at arms. I mean, is there anywhere else where, where people connect with you online? Kind of, you know, where are you hanging out, you know, just, on, uh, on these, uh, on these distraction on, sites that we talked about? I'm on Instagram. You can find me there. And, and my website is just my name, stephenpressfield.com. All right. I'm everywhere. We'll get all that. We'll, we'll, we'll get that plug. Absolutely. So one question that I end every single episode with, uh, with, you know, obviously here we, you know, the title of the show is The Superhuman Life. And, you know, ringing true to, to a lot of what we shared here today, I do believe that we were, you know, created with a very specific purpose. And, you know, when we can harness that belief and then combine it with taking control of our own physical, you know, this body that we were given, the vessel that we get to experience this life with, that is what I think about when I discuss living a superhuman life. So I always give every guest kind of the opportunity to kind of put this in, in, in their own terms. But Stephen Pressfield, how would you define living a superhuman life? Um, okay, let me, I'm going to answer that a little differently than maybe you might think. Yeah. Um, the one thing about when you kind of find your calling and you start really on a true path, it's boring and it's ordinary. And that's the sort of the seat. I don't mean really boring, but it's like if you, if Michael Jordan goes into the gym to practice in his heyday, he just shoots free throws. He practices a move out of the corner. He runs wind sprints. You know, if you watch Steph Curry do his pregame, you ever watch him do his pregame yeah. thing with the rubber bands and everything? I mean, and he does it. He's been doing it for like 20 years, 30, whatever. So the thing of, I think a lot of times we think, as we're trying to find the quote unquote superhuman life, that all of a sudden, Fireworks are going to go off, you know, it's going to be orgasmic, every, you know, and, and it isn't. It's very every day. It's very much, you know, uh, the soldier in the trenches. And what separates the men from the boys is the ability to stay there. You know, one of the my models that I think about is Musashi Miyamoto, the guy, the famous, you know, Japanese swordsman who wrote the, the Book of the Five Rings. And his whole life was about, you know, mastering the sword. And, you know, so that they said that at the end of his life, he didn't even need a sword, right? He could just kill you just by looking at you. But his, I'm sure that if we could have watched his day, it would seem very, very ordinary, except the level that he was operating on. So that would be my one sort of note of encouragement to everybody. It's not going to be fireworks when you're, when you're on the path. It's going to be, but it is going to be peace of mind. No, I love that. And no, I, I, I agree 100% with it. And I love the, you know, I love the Masashi, you know, analogy here. It, it's, I, I think Bruce Lee had something very similar. They said, I'm just, you know, kind of summarizing what he said, but you know, it's like, he's not interested in the person that's practiced 10,000 kicks. You know, he's interested in the person that's practiced one kick 10,000 times or, or something to that, something uh -huh. to that nature. So um, it is, it is true, you know, and, and, and as an entrepreneur, you know, as, as a business owner, like it's, you know, the success is found in, in the everyday, you know, monotonous task, you know, sales, copywriting, you know, email outreach, shooting content, creating videos, you know, all the things that, you know, when you look at on the, on the finished product that looks glamorous, but it's showing up every week, you know, to record these episodes, releasing them at 7am, you know, showing up for my YouTube channel every single day, putting a video out, even going back to when nobody was watching it, you know, I could have easily said, you know, what am I doing this for? You know, we're here now seven months in and we're reaching, you know, 30, 40,000 people, uh, you know, with, with some of our videos. So it's, so it's absolutely incredible and, and, and so true. So once again, Stephen, this has been an absolute pleasure uh, for you guys out there that are listening. Obviously, make sure to check out any of, of, of Stephen's books. I mean, I recommend The War of Art 
for anybody that is that is looking to you know kind of step out of 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 what they're struggling with or, or work through that resistance writers entrepreneurs you know if you have an idea that that is maybe living inside of you and you know it needs to come out check that out um also the warrior ethos another book we didn't we didn't get to the incredible short easy read but we're gonna we're gonna get some people here with the men at arms um so so as as always guys we appreciate we love you for steven pressfield frank rich if you haven't done so yet subscribe leave us a five-star rating and review but we will see you next week Bye.